Hello, this is Mrs. Vega. This is our chapter two notes. Chapter two deals with native Mississippians. Backstory. In 1492, an estimated two to 18 million Native Americans lived in what is today North America. Columbus thought we landed in India, so he called the island's inhabitants Indians. That is where the word and the name Indians came from, is Christopher Columbus. Why? He thought he was in India. The native Mississippians lived in harmony with the environment and took great care to maintain ecological balance. The southern environment allowed them to develop an extensive agriculture. Like we talked about in chapter one, our soil is awesome. It's great for growing things. The native Mississippians realized that and took great care in the soil. And because they did that, they were able to grow beans, squash, and corn. Corn, which they called maize, was their staple crop because it could be cooked and stored in many ways. So staple crop, when I say the word staple crop, it reminds me of a staple that holds together a packet of paper. A staple holds that packet together. Corn held them together. That was their staple food. When in doubt, they had corn to rely on. Where they stored it was in granaries. That's one of your vocabulary words. That's why it's highlighted. Indians mostly ate deer meat until Hernando de Soto and his conquistadors brought a large herd of swine. The Indians grew to love pork and would often steal the swine from de Soto. The swine that escaped are the reasons that there are razorbacks in several southern states. These guys here that we see were not native to Mississippi and to the southern states. They are only here because Hernando de Soto brought them on his expedition and some got loose. Besides deer meat, they also fished, um, and they didn't have a rod and reel like we do. They had to use all different types of techniques like trot lines and nets. Language. The dominant language of the Indian nations in the southeast was some form of Muscogee. Besides that, they also used pictography. That's just like what it sounds like. It kind of sounds like Pictionary. They used pictures to represent words. As far as family was concerned, they were actually matrilineal, which means they traced their lines of descent through their mothers. And social organizations were called clans. And clans included several families with a common ancestry. So they were related. If you were a member of a clan, you were related to the people that were around you usually. Because of that fact that you were related to most people in your clan, clans were exogamic. That meant that they had to marry outside of the clan. You could not marry a fellow clan member. Back then, marriages were often for like political reasons, not because someone fell in love. So if there were two tribes that were about to be at war with a bigger tribe, they may have the chief's daughter marry the other tribe's chief's son and form an alliance through marriage to protect themselves. Religion, organized religions is what they had and they believed in life after death. They worshiped many spirits and they often had ceremonies, lots of ceremonies. One was the green corn ceremony. Um, it was a ritual that was held in late August in anticipation of a bountiful harvest. Like we said, they were very like spiritual and they took great care and were very thankful for the earth so they would perform ceremonies they would even after killing a deer some tribes would even like pray and thank the deer and they wouldn't just take the meat and go they used the deer's skin they use everything the bones they they did not let anything go to waste Burial traditions varied. After someone died, it just kind of depended on which type of tribe you were in with what happened after someone passed. So Natchez, for example, they practiced human sacrifice. So if their tribal chief died, um, because there was life after death, they felt like someone needed to die with the chief so that he had someone there to accompany him in life after death. 
The Chickasaw actually buried their dead with their favorite possessions under their cabin floor. So, like, if your grandmother passed, she would be buried under your cabin's floor with, like, her favorite necklace or whatever. So you would actually be living on top of your grandmother, which is, sounds a little bit weird to us, but that's what they believed was right to do. And Choctaw laid their dead on raised platforms so the body could decompose, then the flesh was removed, and the skeleton was buried. Again, this all might sound a little bit different to us, but that is what they believed, and that is how they performed their burial traditions. Recreation. Chunky was one of the sports that they played. Um, it was a game where there was a big wheel, and it was rolled really, really fast, and the warriors ran alongside it, and they threw spears at it and tried to, like, move the wheel into the other direction and, like, direct where it was going to land. And then there's stickball. Stickball is where we got lacrosse from. Um, 200 to 300 people plus on each team in a large field. And some of these fields were, like, from village to village, miles, miles long, and there was, like, no out of bounds. And there was this really, really tiny ball, like, smaller than a tennis ball, and these little wooden sticks. And they would just battle. And they were first to, like, 100 points won. Games lasted for days. And it was nicknamed the Little Brother of War. The reason that was the nickname is because instead of going to war, say one tribe wanted to fish in a stream and the other tribe said, no, this is our stream, instead of going to an actual war war, they would play a stickball game against each other and the winner got rights to that stream. As far as their government was concerned, most tribes were organized by towns and villages or settlements that exercised some forms of local self-government. Tribal councils were composed of mingos, which are the chiefs. And they ruled the nation with advice of tribal elders, and they ran based off of custom and tradition. So because they ran based off of custom and tradition, they looked to their elders for advice. You might have heard the saying, trust your elders, listen to your elders. They believe that that is what you needed to do because elders have obviously lived longer, they have experienced more, so they have more insight, and they might have better advice than to someone who'd never been through that type of experience before. And back then, there were no real prisons and, like, judge, jury type things. So if you ended up killing someone back then, the victim's family could get their vengeance. If I was to kill my neighbor, my neighbor's brother could kill me. And if I wasn't there to kill, they would kill a member of my family. It was like an eye for an eye. And calumet is one of your vocab words. That's just the peace pipe. So during these tribal councils, they would pass this around just as like a type of tradition and ritual. There were three major tribes, the Natchez, the Choctaw, and Chickasaw. This is blank because in class I had people branch off and find facts about each tribe. But the main things that I would like you to know are that the Natchez, um, they, they worshiped the great sun and they made mounds. The Choctaw were peaceful Argarians, and the Chickasaw were hunters and warriors. How I remember the difference between Choctaw and Chickasaw, because they both kind of start with the same sounds and end kind of the same. Chickasaw, S-A-W, is like a saw a tool. It's sharp, just like a weapon when you hunt or fight. So the Chickasaw were a little more violent than the Choctaw. There were also small tribes back then. In addition to the three major tribes, there were several small tribes or bands that were located in what is now our state. Little, no, little is known about them, however, because they had to merge with larger tribes or move outside of Mississippi. These are just some of the small tribes that we know were in our area. The reason that we don't know much about them is because they couldn't really fend for themselves. So if there was a war or they were threatened by Europeans or threatened by whatever, they might have to join up with the Choctaw, Chickasaw, or Natchez just to survive, or they would have to run. So they didn't really get to have their own identity because they weren't big enough to defend themselves. The Indian Removal and Trail of Tears 
After America won its independence from England and established several states in the Deep South, white populations increased dramatically. When farmers arrived, they realized the Choctaw and Chickasaw occupied much of the fertile soil. In the first chapter, we talked about how there was so much fertile soil. And when people came, they were like, hey, we can grow so many different things. This is awesome. Well, that land was already occupied by the Choctaw and Chickasaw. So the only way that they were able to get it was through the Indian Removal Act. And this was a federal policy. That meant it was, it was totally legal back then. It authorized the forced removal of thousands of Indians to Indian territory in what is now eastern Oklahoma. They said, hey, this is our land now, but we'll give you a piece of land in eastern Oklahoma. How are they going to get there exactly? They had to walk. The Trail of Tears was the forced removal of Indians from the southeastern U.S. that began with the Choctaw in the early 1830s. The Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole tribes were also forced to leave their land, and many died. In order to get to Oklahoma, they walked. And it was cold and brutal, and the elderly couldn't really keep up, and the young weren't strong enough to survive. Lots of people died. It was very sad. There was also land secessions. So basically, the Trail of Tears were for those who were like, didn't want to make an alliance. They said, this is our land. What are you doing? This isn't fair. Some tribes, though, got offered payments and promises of other parts of land in the area if they would get rid, succeed where they were then. Do you think they got paid? No. They laughed and said, yeah, okay, you'll pay us if we leave. Okay, well, they did not get paid. And because they felt so betrayed, they actually joined forces with Confederates during the Civil War. They fought with the South. So if Indians were fighting in the war, you would find them on the South side of the Civil War because they had been betrayed by the North. That is the end of our chapter two notes.